quick rundown of three of the case studies from the Tea Landscape uh, Partnership Project, which is just finished. Um, and just to give a bit of context to this, you'll have all probably heard and worked with various um, landscape partnerships. And our, our landscape was around Perth, to almost to Dundee, um, across the Tay to sort of Abernethy, round the back of Protebiot, um, and that was our parcel of land. <coughs> 2.6 million, four years, five <coughs> members of staff, various funders, lots of stakeholders, and a really kind of complicated um, number of projects. We had 29 in total, each with a different um, three or four different projects within, um, and I was in charge of delivering the historic environment projects um, with Perth and Ross Heritage Trust. So our projects, conserving and restoring both natural and built features, um, we also were really interested in connecting people with this tea estuary and getting them to really participate and be part of that, um, of that landscape and really celebrate um, what, what, what it had to offer. Um, also, we had a big focus in training and local and traditional skills in boat building and in traditional masonry. And it's fab to be in the, the engine shed and see this, the same thing happening here. Um, and yeah, lots and lots of interesting um, bits and bobs, and I don't have enough time to talk about them all um, today. So I'm, I'm going to start off with our early settlers project, um, and this was one of our kind of um, um, a, a really a fun projects, getting lots of different people involved. I had lots of different groups, members of the local community, primary schools, all working together to kind of look for um, uh, early peoples in the TS area. Yeah. So we were really looking to get people to be part of this research firsthand and to take an active role in discovering and identifying um, new, new, um, new information and also to kind of further our, our um, knowledge on the early prehistoric period in, in this area and try and build up a few more um, lithics or, or possible sites um, that could add into, into what we know about, about that landscape. So we started our um, our base our base study really started with this um, post glacial shoreline map from the University of Dundee, uh, showing where the where the river, both the Erin and the Tay, would have would have um, would have kind of gone to, um, and we used that shoreline as our kind of target point um, to find pockets of activity around the around the Tay. Oops. Um, yeah, the, the difficulty with a site with a with a landscape like this is the multi multi functions and the way it's been farmed, different landowner permissions, trying to get somebody who's actually happy to let you go on and tromp around the field and eat lots of biscuits and make a generally make a lot of noise, which is what we were doing a lot of the time. Um, and yeah, get get in those sites. So we had quite a few um, interesting sites, and we followed a very similar methodology uh, across the way. And we actually went very slowly uh, um, and field walked uh, across across areas in a really slow and meticulous way. And that was in conjunction with, with talking to Torben Bjart Ballin, who helped us with our with our um, our finds retrieval and analysis. So this map just shows you a couple of the areas that we looked at. We went um, to Freeland Farm and we also looked at some of the some of the sites over at Pit Roddy, for those of you who might know it. You can see the kind of post-glacial shoreline has got a kind of wee inlet up there um, and uh, Freeland um, was nice right, ne right down by the urn um, and we were on the um, south side of that site. Um, so this map just gives you a wee um, demonstration of some of the um, finds and things that we were finding. Um, uh, Tony Simpson volunteered, sadly no longer, no longer with us, um, he um, did a huge amount of work producing all of, the, all of the GIS data, putting all of our finds locations into GIS and then we were able to give that to Torben and to um, Leanne for, for creating it into final, um, final, final drawings. So what did we find? Um, we probably spent around um, six weeks or so in the field with a team of about 15, myself and 15 volunteers or classes of P5, P6 or P7. And what we found at the Freeland site, um, um, which was fascinating, was this use of the, this carnelian material, um, which is a member of the Chalcedony family, um, in late Mesolithic um, uh, uh, stone uh, lithic um, making. 
you can see the colour is really, really interesting. Um, and it was really quite um, easy to spot in the clay, which was, which was good for us as well. And we found around 700 pieces of that from Freeland Farm. Um, and, uh, and this appears to be um, late uh, meso in date, with some evidence of Neolithic at that site too. So that was a fantastic discovery for our volunteers. They were really, really interested um, and happy to be part of, of that. Um, <coughs> so our, our outcomes for early settlers, and a summary, is we, we've identified one new site, which is really, really interesting, um, with around 900 new bits of lithics um, I, I, um, discovered and retrieved from across our TLP area, as well as bits of medieval pottery and other, other bits of material. Um, and we've also kind of revised the new field walking approach for, for sites, like, sites like this, where, where you have really small flakes of um, material that are very difficult to see. Um, and we've also had lots of engagement with um, the local kids and, um, and communities um, tying in with the Forestry Commission's fantastic Wolf Brothers series, if, if any of you have seen it. So that's a really quick rundown of the Early Settlers project. And I'm going to go into our next biggest archaeology project, which was the hill forts of the Tay. I don't know, has anybody been up Moncrief Hill for a walk locally? Yeah? Oh, and there's some, yes, fabulous. Good view, isn't it, up there? Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so we've excavated a total of three hill forts um, as part of the hill forts of the Tay project. I'm just going to talk to you about the main one. But this um, picture is really quite nice because you can see both the hill forts that are on, on Moncrief Hill. So this is this bigger green blob is moored on top and then the small green one is Moncrief Hill Fort itself. They both command very different views of the landscape. Um, Moncrief has a view down uh, Strathairn uh, and Moordun looks almost, almost you, can, well, you can see Dundee from it, but where the two rivers meet, the Tay and the Erne, Moored on top sits right in, in that position. It's a really powerful uh, place in that landscape. So our, our brief was um, really just trying to build on all the work that the SURF project have done to the south, um, Tessa Poller and colleagues, um, and also um, uh, Rampart Scotland as well, um, and <laughs> look at trying to date these new sites in the TLP area and build on a bit more of what we know about this really interesting uh, site type um, and also to really uh, the, the, I mean the Moncrief Hill Fort site and Abernethy actually they're visited every day by local people walking their dogs who are constantly wandering over it and we really wanted to let them be part of <coughs> digging up what's under their feet um, and we just wanted to just try and understand a bit better what are these sites for what do they mean and and, and their occupation and context in the, in the landscape <coughs> So this is moored on top from above. I think Dave, Dave Cowley and Dave Strachan flew over this and took a photo one day. Um, and you can see quite nicely in this photo the, um, the carriageway, which has probably been put in sort of 19th century. This curve, that's your access up onto site. And we think it might have reused some entrance ways, but that is, um, that's a later addition to the site that would have been put in to bring either um, carts up for taking stone away, robbing out stone, or for the estate bringing the lord and lady up on the hill uh, to have a wee glass of wine and a picnic. Um, so as with every, um, every, every, of the, every site that we've excavated, we undertook some geophys. So this is the magnetic survey of Mordon Top, fairly inconclusive. And the, mag uh, the resistivity, which is fantastic, really shows clearly um, this is the Royal Commission's map underneath, really clearly kind of uh, ties in with what we had on our topographic survey and the, um, the resistivity. The big bands of white being really high <coughs> concentration of, of stone. So we really used the Commission's map for our base of, of uh, trench layer and trench plan. It was our really go-to um, and it was incredibly, incredibly <coughs> useful. Um, and the questions we had from this site were really kind of big general questions. And we wanted to look at every single phase of, possible phase of construction. You can see here we've got, let me just get this right. So we've got the possibly original, original uh, rampart here. 
Um, and then there's been an, a second phase of construction with an annex to the top. Um, and then you've got this really chunky top citadel here. And this is your carriageway that kind of comes up onto the top of the hill. And that's the cairn for those of you that have visited the site. It's, um, it's colossal in size, but our trench is really focused on, tr on understanding each of these large bits of monumental architecture and trying to get a date, if possible, uh, from the material. So um, our first, this is over three years of excavation. Um, one of our first trenches was looking at the two earliest, possibly earliest ramparts. And um, that's a 30, 30 meter long trench um, across the two of them. And you can see in the top picture, the kind of size of the stones um, and the, the size of the construction directly onto the, um, onto the bedrock in the bottom of the picture as well. Um, the, this is um, monumental in scale. Um, and also the stone in the picture you see there is from the hill itself. That's um, the, natural, the natural stones that's been quarried from that site. One of our next trenches was looking at a possible entranceway. So this trench um, uh, is just off the carriageway as you're coming up the hill and it's part of the annex. So we wanted to see if we could identify whether it was an existing entranceway that had been reused or, um, or, or what was going on with this annex. And again, as with the other site, uh, the other two trenches, which are, uh, the other two ramparts, which I didn't actually mention, five metres wide, they're all five metres wide and width, and with this really nice facing stones on either side. And there's been some sort of earlier um, structure um, in the middle of this one as well, possible rebuilding. And I think it just shows you, this picture shows you really nicely the hugging of the, the natural bedrock. You can see where it's the stones being quarried out in places. And you've got these really large, chunky kind of foundation boulders and then this kind of dry, dry stone um, construction on the top. Um, um, in our first season, we looked at trying to understand a bit more about the top, top side of the fort. Um, this citadel uh, section was always thought to have been Pictish indeed. Uh, there's a Pictish battle recorded um, at Moncrief in um, 728, I think it is. Um, and um, we were wondering what the connection was with this top um, big, big fort, the big, the big um, citadel at the very top. So again, you can see the size of the construction is massive, um, and, but it was fairly, fairly similar in construction to the rest of the site. There was nothing that looked particularly different at that stage. So we then moved on to feature A, which is a really interesting mound on um, the kind of north east of the site. And we excavated one trench, which identified another five metre thick wall, um, which will make more sense in the next one. And in 2016, we excavated a larger trench to kind of open that up more. And you can see quite clearly this fantastic um, stone facing <coughs> that continues into here. And then the inner wall is there. Uh, and it's kind of lost in that part here. Continues around here. So we've got a kind of really um, um, solid, um, almost circular structure. And we also picked up the entranceway um, uh, up there. So construction-wise, what is, what is this site? This is sitting inside um, two ramparts. It's protected by two ramparts. It's sitting on a mound. So you can see this naturally terraced bedrock. It's been um, quarried from that, and it kind of creates an even more defensive position. And you can see the stone at the top. We've got a mixture of the, the natural uh, the bedrock and also red sandstone. And we had a large quantity of red sandstone that had been brought onto site. Um, and we think it's actually it's been brought up the hill. It's, there's too much of it to be um, an erratic. So just some other nice pictures showing the um, showing this monument. We had a lot of discussion. Um, um, colleagues at AOC were excavating this with us. A lot of discussion of whether is this a brock? And um, there are two other brocks in Perth and Ross. Um, one at Castle Craig and one, you can see almost see both of them actually, and the other up on King Seat um, at, next to Dunstan and Hillfort. Um, uh, but I think what we have here is a monumental rent house, it's not a, it's not a brook. Um, there's a large, evident, a large amount of burning in the interior, you can see the red material at the top. 
And also we had quite a lot of cut mark stones pop up in and around all of the construction. And um, you can see this here built into this um, monumental roundhouse type structure and also dotted around the site and the rubble and the, and the material that we were, we were removing. The entranceway to this building is really interesting. I think it's had a few phases um, of construction and modification. On the far side, you can see this really lovely bit of shaped stone, um, really kind of like a thin bit of pizza almost, um, and the, uh, which is really good. And also large con concentration of the red, reddish pink sandstone. Um, throughout, I think in our last season of excavation, we really concentrated on the interior of this building, and that's Dawn from um, EOC Archaeology with some of our uh, volunteers, and they they discovered um, a large quantity of burnt material, including some uh, worked bone pins that had survived in the in the, in the middle of this building. Um, uh, so yeah, so really really interesting, and we're in the middle of the post excavation analysis on this at the moment. And that's just some of the, the chunks of charcoal. We actually had, um, I don't know how many people will know, but Duke McLean helped dig this building, which was a good laugh. Um, and he found um, a really nice bit of burnt uh, timber from the roof. Um, and and that, was, uh, that was really nice. So back up onto the top of the hill, um, we've looked at every of the large walls on site. Uh, and we really wanted to have a look at the interior and the commission in their uh, topographic survey had identified two circular features <laughs> on the interior um, and we wanted to see if they were um, later, um, later or um, contemporary uh, dwellings or roundhouses within the, within the site. So in 2016 we put uh, quite a big trench across it. I think this is five by, um, five by 20 metres. Um, uh, to try and see what was going on um, and we didn't actually find hardly any evidence at all of those structures uh, instead we found kind of little sunken robbed out hollows but we did pick up a line of um, stones which kind of related to the top citadel wall so in 2017 we went back and we excavated a bigger trench across this section of wall <laughs> And um, you could actually see this from space, I think, when it was, um, when it was built. Um, a, a colossal and really fantastic piece of um, uh, architecture, five metres um, in thickness. And as with the, the rest of the site, um, you've got these, this timber facing and a rubble core um, uh, along it. But what was different about our top citadel wall, which we hadn't seen in our earlier trench, um, we found some evidence of possible um, platforms, you can see the sort of flattish pile of stones there, possible construction platform or possibly a, a surface for, for cooking during the construction of this wall. Um, but we also had evidence of it being timber laced. So where the, where the bits of timber are in at the moment, that was just as a little prop in case it, in case it fell, well, in, case it, in case it fell basically. So you can see the very coarse kind of rubble, bouldery type stones at the bottom, and then the coursing <coughs> of red, red sandstone and the natural volcanic rock, uh, the, the bedrock, um, and then the gaps for the, for the timbers. Uh, so that was the front of all. This is the inside face of the wall, which was not as well built as you would kind of expect, but again, really good evidence of, um, of the timber lacing. <coughs> Oh, one minute, Fab. Um, so yeah, so part, um, so as part of that, um, um, we've been using, uh, we've been working with um, <coughs> Professor Tipping from the University of Stirling to try and create a whole environmental picture of the site, and um, and he's come up with some really interesting uh, findings, which we'll be including as part of our publication. Um, it looks like the site was cleared. Um, by the Bronze Age, by the end of the Bronze Age, um, before this, before this uh, hill fort was constructed, um, and that's some of the, the team there itself. Um, and just a little reconstruction picture uh, for you of, of the site. You can see the, the citadel at the top and the, the annex, and then the kind of what we think is this, this rampart has kind of gone out of use and has been replaced by this one with the, with the annex. Um, 
So I don't really have time for Castle Law Abernethy, so I'm just going to whiz through this. Uh, Castle Law Abernethy dug over 100 years ago, so we went back. Um, Christensen uh, supervised two local gentlemen on this um, site in 1898 for a period of, I think, about five years. So we wanted to assess how degraded or how well preserved it had um, stayed. This is just an example. Again, this is a type site, timber lacing. His photo on the, on the right, the same section of wall on the left. Um, uh, basically, the site has not survived well at all. Uh, which is unfortunate, but um, yeah, that's it. Um, there was one really nice section that hadn't been excavated before, and you can see the timber lacing sockets um, a lot running along and then uh, stepping down there as well. Um, and what we're hoping to do with the site at Abernethy is tie in with his, his archive and the environmental remains he took from the cistern there um, to get um, some good dating evidence, and that Dawn's undertaking that at the moment. So our main outcomes, uh, we've excavated three hill forts um, and we've got new dating evidence for each site and they're all Iron Age, they're all Middle Iron Age in dates. We don't have any Pictish or Early Medieval dates, um, which is interesting in itself. We've had a huge amount of engagement with um, local communities and, and school kids um, and um, lots of really interesting questions and things to tie up at the end of that. I think I'll leave you there. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah.